Okay. Tara Shannon. Martha's Milk. And Neethi Bali with Farm to Fork Meat Riot. What is today? Today is Sunday, January 28th. Yes. Welcome, Tara. Thank you so much. All right, good friends. afternoon. We're um, we're recording live from the food church here on North Carolina, and I'm speaking with Tara Shannon from Martha's Milk in Tennessee, uh, and this is just two mamas. We're just two moms um, doing what we have to do because we're trying to save the babies. Isn't that right, Tara? That's exactly right. Exactly. So this is just our casual conversation that we decided to record for the benefit of all the mamas who are seeking this type of information. Tara, how did we become acquainted? So from my best memory, Rogue of 2020, where you were speaking, and that was a pivotal year, I think, for just, for me, we were very underground selling milk then, um, but someone at the Homesteaders conference had said, hey, go to this conference, and I, I figured out at that conference, we were riding on the coattails of a lot of warriors that had faced down bureaucracy for years to have food freedom. And across the gamut, there were so many powerful stories. But you guys were all wearing those shirts. I don't care. And I wanted to know why you didn't care. I wanted to know. And then, of course, you know, I heard you speak and I bought your book. And, you know, I, I've said it before, but I read your book. I couldn't put it down. Um, and we have some similarities. It's funny that you said this is just two moms because you know a mom's heart. Like, I... Uh, I would just reread. I was rereading the intro to your book today, and uh, Joel Salton saying, "You know, like your force. Your your. Some people will try to tell you to tone it down. That's what I was trying to look for in my verbiage earlier. Is like, no, no, you don't tone it down after you've lost a child. I don't tone it down after I spent multiple visits in the ER, Vanderbilt, Williamson, Vanderbilt. Very, you know." well reputable institutions here when we lived in Franklin trying to kill my daughter that is traumatic trying to help a kid that's crying and screaming in pain and you you finally get it down to food and it's the food that's causing it you're not going to tone it down you're definitely not going to tone it down from other moms so mm -hmm. to answer your original question I think it's God I think it's God we were even there and I I can't adequately put into words what hearing your story, your testimony, and your journey, and your book did for me, and I posted it online in my Martha's Milk group today, but I am committing to rereading it because it's fire, and it's fire that we all need in our soul to commit back to, you know, our purpose, our purpose, and what I feel like God's purpose is for me is to teach what was lost to my kids and I'm learning alongside with them. Like we're just drinking from a fire hose, exposing everything we can expose. So hopefully our children and their children and the next children will know more truth than we know and be able to not be sick, to be healthy. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you're talking about the food. Well, I was learning that, it was the food, but, you know, it was the MMR vaccine that turned on mm -hmm. our daughter's cancer markers, but also any of the vaccinations that we had allowed before that. And I thought I was doing something by uh, being very selective with the vaccines at that time because, you know, I didn't know any better than anybody else, you know, when mm -hmm. it came. And, and what I learned... Um, you know, the hard way because what, what I learned is that I was trusting professionals because I was convinced by the orthodoxy that I was not smart enough. I wasn't good enough. I didn't know enough 
to be able to love my child and advocate for and protect my child by myself. Mm-hmm. And you know, Tara, that was the big deal for me was I had to take full responsibility and acknowledge that I allowed professionals to make decisions for my children because I allowed them to convince me that I didn't know any better. You know, I thought about that today. Um, That's another thing we have in common. Um, And I forgot about that. I'm glad you brought that up. My mom was vaccine injured when I was 16. And she was in bed for a year. No one knew what chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or, I mean, no one knew a lot about any of that. She actually went all the way to North Carolina to a doctor to get diagnosed after a year. But she was a biker and a runner. And after taking a booster shot because her office was next to the nurse's office in a big tile plant in Jackson, Tennessee, Mm -hmm. they convinced her she was at risk to get this series of Hep B vaccines. And so she, she's never recovered from that and it ended my parents marriage Mm -hmm. I'm not you know we're not going to go into all that but it 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 changed a lot in our family and caused that that still impacts our family today Mm -hmm. you know we've talked about a lot of that in the past but divorce it Mm -hmm. it led to a divorce it led to fractured family and that was Mm -hmm. one decision to get a vaccine and health and how you know lack of health and I remember reading in your book that you guys flip-flopped families and houses around and you were taking shifts from 7A to 7P and how disruptive health crisis in a family is. And that's long lasting. Mm-hmm. And so we, we knew as adults not to take vaccines. But when I had my own children, what's wild is I would, the, the orthodoxy that, you know, the medical establishment <laughs> is so powerful even though I lived through all of that nightmare in my own family, I was still not sure. I was mm-hmm. still made to doubt. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should get my kids vaccinated. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. And I waffled. We never did, but we came really close. And what's wild is after knowing all that, the brainwashing from 2020 was so strong. And Jay was off work for seven months with, I'm just going to say whatever that was. Mm-hmm. Um that he, we strongly were like, maybe we've been brainwashed the other way. It, it's, <laughs> it takes every ounce of wherewithal to wake up daily and go against these um, thoughts. Right? Yes. They, these thoughts. Uh, they put these, they yeah. plant these thoughts into our heads because what are beliefs? They're thoughts we keep thinking. So they just keep giving us these thoughts. And so, I also came from, you know, my grandfather was a renowned homeopathic physician, Tara, and everybody's like, how did you grow up with homeopathy and then vaccinate your kids? Because I didn't have enough information to go against the orthodoxy because I come from a family of doctors. And it was our understanding that allopathic medicine complements homeopathic medicine and naturopathic medicine because, you know, allopathic has a place. It is the best at opening the body and closing the body. You know, allopathic medicine is really, really good at putting you back together again if you've been broken apart. Correct. You know, they're really good at that. And I was never raised to believe that doctors were the devils. I was raised to believe that we're on the same team. And I still believe that we're on the same team with the living men and the women, but we're not on the same team with the corporatocracy. So, you know, let me explain that, I guess, you know. It was, yeah. I, it was actually, um, you know who explained this to me was um, Alan Savory. Okay. So one of my mentors is Alan Savory. I, um, I had read all his books and, you know, I was following all his work. <clears throat> and I had the pleasure of meeting him um, and spending a weekend with him. And we were at the Savory Institute Global Family 
reunion on White Oak Pastures in um, Alabama. Georgia, Alabama. They're on the Georgia, Alabama border. And so anyway, I was down there. And that weekend was really incredible because uh, Alan had just, um, I guess it might have been within the first couple of years of him having established the Savory Institute with Michigan State University. And I was asking him, you know, about all things permaculture and regenerative agriculture, you know, because for me, my focus has always been that I want to be the catalyst to reestablish, reestablish the small family farm food system. And in my work, you know, that means that I had to study these incredible permaculturists. And what I realized is that everybody has a different focus. Okay. So like, Alan's focus was trying to prove to everybody that, you know, you need animals to have plants. You need animals to restore the soil to ensure the and, and support the aquifers. So to reverse desertification, you can use livestock. They don't cause desertification. They reverse desertification. And just like my other mentor, Joel Soliton, his his focus is 100% that he wants people to recognize farmers as white collar and not blue collar. And that, that's another division by the corporatocracy. They want to create this division between white collar and blue collar because when you're blue collar, if you're doing any of the jobs that are blue collar, they want everybody to think that you don't really know anything when, in fact, you actually know how to do things and how to make things. You're the makers. The blue-collar people are the makers. They're the doers. I mean, a farmer has to be a veterinarian and a plumber and a mechanic and an electrician and a carpenter. I mean, I'm sure I'm leaving some things out, right? You have to... <laughs> you... I'm just glad you know it. <laughs> I mean, the farmers have to also be... You know, the culinary experts, the, you know, the mothers, the fathers, the gardeners. I mean, you have to be everything. And, and, and honestly, everybody used to be a farm. Everybody, it was just a done thing. If you wanted to eat, you had a homestead. Mm-hmm. Period. It wasn't like right now where they're having like this homestead tsunami it was everybody just homesteaded. There was no choice. You were homesteading. And if you were a homesteader, then you had to know how to do things. It's the corporatocracy that pushed everybody into the cities. It's the corporatocracy that dumbed everybody down. It's the corporatocracy that said, no, no, no. You're just, you're more scientific minded. You're more artistic. You're more this. That. They want to put everybody in a pinhole and lock them up. And so Alan said, meet the once you form an institution, that institution no longer operates as human or, you know, on behalf of living men. And I thought, oh my gosh. He said they behave like, you know, a corporate dead fiction, basically. And that's what they are. They're dead fictions. Well, dead speak can't give life. And so now the Savory Institute doesn't know how to give the life the way Alan Savory did. They don't do him any justice. Uh, I'm probably going to get in trouble for that one, Tara, but I mean. Well, that's what, you know, I kind of feel like those things that most people won't say need to be said. And then things can change from that. But if we don't acknowledge where we are, we can't change. And so acknowledging that there's an issue, then you can change it. But if we're going to keep that covered up, that's not doing anybody any good. And then if you enter into any kind of business arrangement with that institution, then you go in fully with a blindfold off and you can get what you say in your foreword of your book or the beginning of your book. If you interact with one person or, you know, one, one meeting, if it gives you something practical to put in place, it's worth it. So, you know, people, people, people need to know these things that ruffle feathers 
and those things need to be changed. So that's that's what we mama bears are here for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we have to be willing to hear each other's stories. Mm-hmm. I mean, sharing the stories is fine, but these days everybody only wants to share their stories. They don't want to hear the other stories. And I think that in order for us to honor the law, God's law, which, you know, natural law and God's law is the same law. It is based in the universal expansion. We are here to procreate. We are here to expand the universe. We're not here to, um, you know, repeat the past. Yeah, we definitely don't want to repeat the last 100 years for sure. Um, (laughs) So one of the things that you and I have talked about is the truth. You know, what are the top top two laws? Will you go into that? Yeah, you were, that was actually very fascinating because um, I think it's important for people to know how we came to that. We were, we were, you were asking me about religion, remember? Yep. And I would like to talk about that because I do feel like that can be a touchy subject for people. But if we don't talk about it, you know, I, I grew up in a culture where you don't talk about differences in religion. It just makes people uncomfortable. You know, you don't talk politics, you don't talk religion. Well, how about we talk about it respectfully? Mm. And you learn you learn about what another person thinks, how they worship, you know, mm-hmm. what are their experiences, and you learn something like that. You take away, you take away something. But if you're afraid to discuss it, like a lot of topics then we don't, we're not learning anything. And so I was, I'm, I am still fascinated to learn more about your faith, about how you, I mean, everything for me is through the lens of faith. How do we make all what we're seeing make sense through the lens of faith? And it's interesting to me, your lens. And so can you, t- can you talk about that? Yeah. So, you know, we our, our parents um, were raised in India. That is where all of their, history is. And so, you know, our parents were born slaves of the British India Company. They were under what was called British rule, and it was blatant, blatant British rule. Uh, They were enslaved. That's what that means. That means all of India was enslaved by the crown. Um, And everyone knows about the story of Gandhi, and Gandhi had realized the fraud and my parents, my mother was born during the blackouts, you know, when there was the separation um, right then, when in, when Pakistan was being formed in 47, she was born. And so in any case, our parents were raised Hindu, but my grandfather was friends with all people. And there were Christians and Muslims and Hindus all in India at the time, and he was friends with everybody. And so during the separation, during the blackouts, there was a lot of, there was the Hindu-Muslim riots. So, you know, whether you were a Hindu or a Muslim, you were on the X. And my grandfather was involved in protecting them and helping them get over the border or helping everybody get on whatever side they needed to be on to be safe because there's no reason for that. There was no reason for that. So, although my parents were raised as Hindus, their friends were Muslim, Christian, whatever, everything. The other thing that people don't understand or know about uh, Hinduism is it's one of the most ancient religions. It's between Hinduism and I think it's I think it's Taoism is the only other oldest religion in the Chinese faith. I could be wrong about that, so... Don't, don't quote me on it, but (laughs) I'm not the knower of the most ancient religions, but I do know that there's a most ancient Chinese religion and the most ancient Indian religion is Hinduism. And, uh, next, right after Hinduism was born Buddhism. Okay. And then down the line, sometime Christianity was born. So we were always taught that Christianity was kind of a toddler 
versus the older faiths. But what, what most people don't really know, I mean, well, a lot of people do know because they're in India and they know this, but <laughs> we have one of the greatest populations on the planet as well. So, um, <laughs> or the largest is what I mean, not just that they're great, they're large. So one of the largest populations on the planet. And, mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people obviously do know this. But in, in Hinduism, all of the other faiths are incorporated in our faith. And when oh, we, I did not know that. That's super interesting. Yeah, when I would try to explain that to people, then they thought, you know, that is, you know, I don't know what they thought because they never would talk to us afterwards. Hmm. So they never really understood what I was saying. But if you read like the Bhagavad Gita or any of our religious books, which are many, we don't have just one like Bible or something. We have many religious books and all of the books encompass all the many stories before Christianity which I know that Christians acknowledge because there's AD and B BC okay. before Christ and after his death right so there was a before Christ and an after death so that means there was things happening before that okay. and if you acknowledge that then you must acknowledge that there was some other faith so what was that faith, you know? And so I'm telling you, I don't know all of them, but what I know for sure is that Hinduism and some Oriental faith also were the two oldest, and then there were many other faiths beyond that, right? And most of these religions were born to divide people because if you follow God's law or universal law, there is that is... Those are immutable, objective laws. And I'll just use like gravity, for example. You don't have to take a class to learn about gravity. Your belief is not required in gravity. It just is. Right? Right. So, so is all... Whether so you believe in it or not, it... That is a truth. And that's one of the other things I think that we have in common is that we know, we both know that there's a truth. We may not agree on how to get there, but we believe there is a truth. In this world we live in, there is truth. Yeah. And you can find it. And it, we don't we don't have to agree on it. But if you're looking at everything we're looking at, like um, the hospital system, the education system, the far, all these institutions that are not, you know, operating as a human and not operating within natural law, how do we see that through our faith lens? And mm -hmm. that's so interesting to me because I have, I mean, years to learn about Hinduism and, and other religions. Like I just, there's not enough time to become a seminarian, right? I mean, there's, <laughs> you could, there's right. so many different tracks you can focus on. But to be respectful and acknowledge, okay, that's your faith. Okay, I have my faith. But I found it beautiful that we agree on, like, do no harm. First, mm -hmm. do no harm. How does that, right. how does that translate to everything we're looking at? And then the other one that you said was do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I'm like, that's, that, that embodies everything. Yeah. If, if everybody just only operates on those two rules, those two laws, first of all, those are universal laws. Also, there is no... No uh, faith out there that is a God-fearing faith that does not have those two laws. I, I mean, I don't know of one. There might be something I don't know about, but I don't. I don't know all the faiths. I haven't studied all of them. But any any God-fearing faith is going to say, "You first do no harm, and then do unto others as you want others to do unto you." And that's, you know, what's incredible is that is the law of the land. There's only two laws on the land. And one is do no harm. And two is do unto others as you want others to do. Do unto you. That means, yeah, you don't kill. Now, the convolution is, okay, now you're not supposed to kill a cow or a chicken or a goat. And so that means you're supposed to be vegetarian. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. Because you raise plants that are living. And you raise animals that are living. All life begets life. But when you go back to the beginning. 
You cannot have plants without animals. The plant wasn't the first thing to show up as life, as proof of life. The first thing that was was to show up as proof of life was the cell. And that is, you know, that would be more... The, the life that was born first was of an animal. And that is what gives gives life. And... And so Alan's work proves it too. He says that it is we require the migration of the livestock, the pressure they put on the land and the soil that actually allows the seeds to grow. And as a regenerative farmer and all of what you're working on over there with the cows, I mean, is that true? It's definitely true, and we're still learning. I mean, we're still learning as much as we can because, you know, we do milk, you know, and we. I was just a, I was just a mom that thought, okay, my kid can't drink pasteurized dead milk. I finally figured that out, and then broke through the the glass of it won't kill you if you drink it raw. So that took a minute, mm -hmm. uh, and then you learn as much as you can about dairy animals and milking them and their schedule and like what you said, be the veterinarian and. Yeah. Oh, and you're being a mom, and we go. You know, we've passed each other at conferences since then. Gay and I are just getting to literally about a year ago. We had soil testing. We had a soil consult here, and we are just wrapping our minds around. Whoa, we started from the milk cow, and we needed to start with the grass and the soil. You know, mm -hmm. and you touch it here and there. But all life, like your book even says, it, all life begins in the soil. Like, we've got to be stewards of that first. And so that's our goal this year, 2024, mm -hmm. is to focus more on that. Um, one of the things I'm going to back up really quickly that I thought was really just so simple but revolutionary, how you can apply this practically to your life if you just follow those two laws, whatever faith you are. And in, in regards to purchasing food, buying food, interacting with the food system, when you said, I can't buy food from a CAFO because animals aren't treated well there. Right. You know, it It has always bothered me. It's just like an animal lover, you know, a steward mm -hmm. of animals. Like, you watch Food, Inc. That's an old documentary. Who hasn't seen that? And if you haven't, go watch it now. I mean, it's on Amazon for $3, a DVD. You can own it and pass copies around. But you see those animals shoved around with bulldozers or, and up to their, you know, hawks in poop and you're you think that's stewarding well you can't watch that and think that's stewarding well and and it, every time you just you know go outside and say oh well, i'll just do this drive through this one time or what i mean you're you're putting dollars toward that system and no one's asking for perfection just think about where you're putting your dollars mm -hmm. and try to make a better decision every day you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. Is it perfection that I refuse to poison my children even a little bit? Like, how much poison is good enough for you? Oh, gosh. That's so good. And I love that. See, you're spanking me out of it. You're spanking me out of wrong <laughs> mindsets. And that's your word. I'm, I'm hijacking your word that sometimes you just spank <laughs> people out of it. But I do, I do need that. And it's changing those thoughts and those ingrained belief systems because... I will let you in a little bit on my journey here. You know, we're mm -hmm. not from here. And Joel's books, he says, don't come in being the weirdo. You know, you can't, <laughs> you can be a Buddhist and you can be a nudist, but you can't be a Buddhist nudist. And so it's probably been a year and a half I posted, hey, why are we buying foods from farms that even do traditional grains? Because we're still supporting this system. Mm -hmm. And that'll, that'll knock you out of a community really fast because we all need each other. You know, we all need to support each other. Right. We had a crisis here where farmers from all backgrounds came and helped us, and my mind was blown. And I was like, okay, this is a touchy subject. It yes. just is. But in my home, I get to choose. And that's what you're saying. Stay in your lane. We talked about that before. Stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. Don't try to control other people. Mm -hmm. But by your walk, you can show, okay, I will be the weirdo because mm -hmm. there is no tolerance for, I mean, yeah, you're not uh, going to put poison in your kids if you really think highly of your kids. Well, I had a, I have, I have people in my membership, and we have someone in the membership who's pregnant right now, and she's a first time mom, 
And her question to me one day was, what do you think about, you know, pediatricians? Like, do, like, I don't know if I, like, I don't know what to do about that, she says. I said, well, do you think that you need someone to teach you how to love your baby? And she was just like, what? And I said, well, do you think so? And she's like, no. I said, okay, well, you don't need anybody. The pediatricians right now, all they're doing is selling a program and a product. It's not like, I mean, when we were growing up, that wasn't really the main thing. And nobody was required to go there on a schedule. Right. Well, wellness checks, that sounds dumb. Um, I need to go get a wellness check. Why? Because I'm well. They're sick, yeah. Oh, oh, you're well and you're going to the doctor to see that you're well? Is that what you're doing? That's stupid. That's like saying when you go to the doctor and they say that you're pre-diabetic and you're like, so do I have diabetes? And they say no. And then you're like, what's pre-diabetes? Do I have diabetes? No. Okay, so I don't have diabetes, right? Right. Okay, well, then I don't have diabetes. I mean, it's I don't know how I wake up every day and live if I'm pre-diabetic. Now, other people right now would say, well, that's ridiculous. You should want to know if you're going to be sick. Well, how about I already know if I am smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol or eating ding-dongs and drinking bang drinks, or I don't even know all the other things that are in an aluminum can that isn't water. If I'm drinking something and it's not water or raw milk, I don't really know what I'm drinking it for. Yeah, let's talk about this because I want to get in this. We didn't even talk about this. I want to talk about it. What about wheat? I want to ask you, because we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. and I like to know what you're eating over there, you know? <laughs> um, and I want to know what your real thoughts are on, because I have a friend who's fully fermenting, old fermenting 24 hours, organic, fresh milk grain. I want to know what your thoughts are on that, because mm -hmm. I've talked to you about it in the past, and people tend to think European grains are better, you can do that, you do it a certain way, but like, in the past... Wheat is a hundred percent no drug. Don't have it in your house. So where where are you on that? Um, we 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 were weedaholics, and we gave wheat up um, fifteen years ago. And when when okay, so I did. I was reading Wheat Belly. Mm -hmm. And I decided to do the seven day challenge that's in Wheat Belly. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that before you really just trust this physician who wrote the book, Wheat Belly, at the mm -hmm. end of the book, he gives you recipes and how to use a microwave. So that is not what I'm trying to sell here. <laughs> but I want you to pay attention to the fact that they explain, this is a, a, a cardiologist who's explaining that wheat causes heart disease, okay? Okay. And... Um, I would even argue right now that even more than wheat and sugar, um, that vegetable oils cause heart disease. Mm -hmm. It's funny. They want everybody to believe that animal fat causes heart disease. But I'm saying to you, it's, I'm not calling it saturated fat, which mixes up coconut oil, which is a plant oil, with you know, ghee or butter or lard or whatever, which is animal fat. I am not going to mix it up like that because everything that the corporatocracy says is lies and immorality. Let's just start with that. So just by mixing those two things up and going with saturated fat is a lie. It, okay. is, immo it is immoral. I'm here to say that anything that's not animal fat if it's plant fat or man-made fat from, I don't know, whatever immoral, scientific way that they make fake animal fat or whatever, I mean, fake fats, you know, 
-hmm. That causes every metabolic dysfunction. Let's just start with that. That's number one. Okay. Number two, um, grains. If you are mixing it up with the oils, then you're already compromised. Because like Joel Soliton will argue, well, we used to eat wheat all the time and it wasn't really that big of a deal. I agree. It was after the Crisco, you know, evolution and corn oil and all of that stuff that everybody came off. Because even in India, they only used to cook with ghee. And, I mean, they use ghee and coconut oil over there and fish oils. And over here, everybody only ever really cooked with lard. Uh -huh. And maybe butter. And, I mean, maybe they clarified ghee here. I don't even know. I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I know that people used animal fats like tallow and bear fat and, you know, whatever. But it wasn't frequently that anybody would ever have had any vegetable oil because, A, we only had horse and wagons. I don't know that anybody even had drills, like electric drills. So how would you even produce a vegetable fat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. The DV, the, it's a talk, Sally Fallon gave that ruling of America. You've seen it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, but the I'm... History, yes. Like, before then, what was going on before then, and how they smeared all that. It's like turn of the century, 1900. It's like early. Early. And I found mm -hmm. a book. Yeah, mm -hmm. I found a book at one of my friends. She owns an antique store. I found a really interesting book. I'll, show you, I'll send some pictures. I can post it on my personal page, or I can mm -hmm. even post it on, I guess, Martha's Milk on Instagram. Um, but it's it was paid for by the corn oil refinery or something and it's it's a little book cookbook they put out and it's old over mm -hmm. 100 years old and all these recipes to switch you to corn oil you mm -hmm. know yeah so yeah so i would agree on that and then you think wheat wheat after that is the next thing to get get out of your pantry well first of all all industrialized grain which means all the grain all over the world you know, is it causes a problem, but let's just not forget there is no restaurant, there is no food company. If you're trying to get away from um, oils, like like plant oils, if you're trying to get away from plant oils, you you cannot do it. You can you can uh, I mean not for anything that's pre made. Let me say that. The only way to get away from all that is to make everything by yourself, like make something at home. There's nothing out there that you can buy that is not using animal, I mean, uh, sorry, plant fat. You know, I mean, I guess there's a couple of things now. I know they used to make potato chips in lard. What, you know, when they make, like, Uts still make some potato chips in lard. A lot of people don't like them because they don't like the flavor of the lard because they're so conditioned to um, plant fats. Yeah, I want to go back real quick. Okay. Yeah. I had a little distraction. I don't know if you heard her come in, but I had a little uh, little girl come in um, distracting me. So, sorry. <laughs> it's We're okay. getting back on focus here on this week. Okay, industrialized grains. So I, I listened to a podcast and it's been like six months ago on Heritage Wheat being grown out like, I want to say Utah area, I probably have that all wrong. But anyway, she was saying like these land race, like, I think it's called land race, I don't even know. But she said it's like so different and people stop and look at their farm because it's how wheat used to look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, we're having anyway, a casual... It was einkorn. Yeah, it's einkorn. She said people yeah. stop 
and look, but you know, if we're ordering, let's just say this normal moms over here ordering einkorn from Azure, you totally stay away from that too, and just say no, just go like forego all grains. <laughs> let me let me let me let me back it up. Expert opinion, whoa, whoa, whoa. yeah. <laughs> your expert opinion. Are there any safe grains? Because there's people uh-huh. Uh-huh. I know them that love bread. <laughs> yeah. Hey, girl, I was a weedaholic, and this is what I have to say: is okay. most of the people who are weedaholics like I was, are not off of plant fats. Okay. Huh. They're wow. not. They're so not. Those first. I mean, I, I don't know anybody who is uh, eating bread. First of all, if you're eating, let's just say that you are that person and you're making the highest quality sourdough bread and that's all y'all eat at home, right? Uh-huh. You're the same person when you're on the road, you are not going to hesitate to eat bread anywhere else because you don't do it all the time. Gotcha. So you're just saying having it, like having access to it, still lacking bread, you're going to say, okay, this one skip out thing. Yeah, you're not, you're not wheat free. You're not wheat free. So you're going to eat wheat anywhere you go. Also, the other problem with that is that, you know, um, I mean, I don't personally believe that you can have good wheat and that your gut can handle it when you've been raised on plant fats and everything else for so long. I don't think any of us can say, any of us who are, who are adults today right now in 2024, I don't know any of the adults here right now, myself included, that we grew up and we did not eat uh, basically garbage at some point. Totally. You know, we literally have been poisoned for the majority of our lives. Yeah, I was going to say like Taco Bell all through high school. And you think this is normal. What's on the dollar menu? Right. Plus the convenience foods that sneak into your home right. when you're teenagers. And so, I mean, I remember. Sneak? I mean, it was we just little. it was just part of our house. I mean, my mom used yeah. to cook, okay? My mother cooked mm-hmm. everything. She made us very traditional Indian meals, which were mostly vegetarian meals. And she had some meat in there, but it wasn't a lot. And it wasn't because she was trying to, or that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't even about money. It is the false belief that you're doing less harm with plants than you are with animals. This is a false belief. Do you know, as a carnivore, I can eat, I can kill one cow. That's one life. Mm-hmm. It's one life that gave life its all its entire life. A regenerative cow gave life its entire life, and now I'm taking that one life, and I can that will that one life will nourish me and my family for a solid three months if I'm carnivore. That's only one life. That's less harm than any amount of plants. Because how many plants do I got to take out for one dinner? Uh How many plants do I have to take out for a fruit snack or whatever? I mean, how many plants do I have to take out? If you're going to just talk about, you know, if you're going to consider plants and animals in this discussion for doing harm, then I win. As a carnivore, do you see what I'm saying? As a carnivore, I win. Yes, you're taking less life. And plants are alive. I mean, I was a biology major. They're alive. And then this is interesting to me that people say, oh, you're you're killing a life. You're taking, you're so cruel. Well, you can look on any social platform today and see people that are talking to trees. They communicate. Mushrooms communicate. There's a communication system. I'm not saying they're intelligent like humans, okay? Mm-hmm. But that you can't say that they have some kind of interesting, I don't even know how to put my finger on it, but I've seen some interesting things that you can't say, oh, that's, you know, I mean, look, we're, 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 I don't know. I just feel like it's a mute argument. Don't argue with, with me about you're, you're harming something and you're not. Yes, it's all harm. And I agree with Joel saying, Respect the life that you're taking. Whether it's a plant or an animal, it was put here to nourish you. Yes. And so I'm not saying plants are put here to nourish us. I'm still mixed on that. I'll just say we're currently mixed on that. We looked at carnivore. We like some plants in our diet. And I've 
I looked at, you know, Paul Saladino who has it. And I'm like, oh, I can have fruits and milk. Maybe I could do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But to say you're such a bad person for taking the life of an animal from the point of like you're you're such a more ethical being than me because you only kill plants. Well, plants are alive. You kill you kill more animals harvesting wheat Wheat, than you do yes, the combines. Yeah, you well, you heard you been in that combine. Yeah, you as a child. Yes. I have been in that combine. My dad brought us deer. Yes, rabbits. Yeah, I have pictures of it in my bed that he mowed over. Yeah, and he harmed, and he would bring them for us to rehab. You can't tell me that's not true. As soon as you see those pictures, I'm like, I live that. I know that to be true. Mm, that's great evidence because I am saying to everybody that. There are more animals and more, well, the soil, you are ripping, you, there's, 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 they're out there spading the soil. They're turning the soil. They're disking the soil. You are killing and causing more harm just to plant wheat than I am eating one, one whole entire cow. Right. That's interesting, especially if you dig down into, you know, all what life is in the soil. Right. Right. And my cow that I ate gave that life to the soil and supported it and fertilized it and, 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 and gave, gave life the whole time. And then we gave thanks. I mean, also who, why would there be cows if we weren't supposed to uh, steward them and have dominion over them? Also, finally, um, let me be very clear. We're the only, only animals. Homo sapiens sapien are the only animals on the planet that have foresight, that have um, creativity, and that have... Um, you know, I mean, the main thing that we have that they don't have is, is, is that we have imagination. Mm. And so it is the reason we were given dominion over them is to be creative and to support them and to respect them and to honor them. And we, we have to steward them. I'm laughing because I'm sitting in my back room watching chickens on my back porch and they're so cute and everything you're saying I'm like yeah totally Mm -hmm. and they're they're delicious Mm -hmm. but they are such a joy to raise Mm -hmm. and um it's funny because you know um I'll just tell you like a side note I came from a very manicured subdivision Mm -hmm. I had a decorator Mm-hmm. in my past I'm not kidding mm-hmm. and uh, and I had you know I had a nice porch and everything was clean and pressure washed and beautiful <laughs> and now I have free range chickens that poop I'm gonna clean that up all over my porch yeah and um it's so funny for the first couple of years my mom was like Terry this is so gross and I was like I get it but they don't respect my premier one netting and I want <laughs> them to range and eat the diet that they need to eat chicken is of the you know chicken and they they like, like to go around and forage and they like to come visit us and peck on the window and I'm gonna put up with the nasty porch to get the, the eggs and the kind of chicken I want so mm-hmm. um but yeah they are a joy and I and I um they I also, that's great. I, I, I think they, they also have a longer life than, than they otherwise would. And they're, um, I mean, I don't know how many eggs even would hatch without your stewardship. Mm. We had a lot of broody ones this year. It was shocking, actually, a lot. And the baby chicks are a joy to watch. I'm going to go back because I got to ask, I got to drill down on this. Okay, mm-hmm. knowing what you know, the yeah. journey you've been on. You know, and I don't know how many people from my, like when I share this on my page, how many people will know your story, but I'm going to get your book into this uh, little milk store and then we're open, we're planning to open our store on our farm in three months. And so it'll be a staple here. I'm so excited just for this reconnection, but I don't know how many people know that you lost your daughter to get on this journey. And so, um, the, the knowledge, you I remember you saying there was an internet. You went to the library, you dug and dug and dug. And um, any moms, like talking to moms, any mom knows that. They would 
research, read, ask people to find the answers. And you've done that and um, applied yourself to uh, honor her memory and to, to, to share with other moms her story and, and to, to try to, to rectify something that's gone way wrong in our country. And you've gone beyond that, beyond the food system, beyond the hospital system, which is so impressive, but going back to food in your home. You know, we covered the vaccines, but going back to food, when you say you're carnivore, what does that mean? Because I've talked to different carnivores. We have carnivores come here to, you know, get milk Mm -hmm. and they buy suet and beef, you know, but Mm -hmm. some carnivores don't drink raw milk. So for you and your family, Mm -hmm. what is, you know, what is a good diet that actually gives you life? Well, I should start with, it depends on how damaged you're, you are. I've had three autoimmune conditions. So my first autoimmune condition was vitiligo, which is cured. And the orthodoxy doesn't believe there is a cure for that. So let me just tell you, there is a cure. And the cure for vitiligo involves light therapy. So I was very early on already having experienced the power of circadian rhythm. And so there's that. That's a whole nother, I think me, we need another couple hours to do that conversation. But so there's that. Circadian rhythm, circadian biology. Um, And then secondly, um, it was, I had um, a thyroid condition. So my thyroid was, I had a hypothyroid. At first, I, I was misdiagnosed like so many times. Because they, the doctors don't know anything. So, you know, Hashimoto's is what it finally turns out to be. And I don't actually even know if that's really true. Because I, I don't actually, I can't actually really know that for sure. But what I know is that that was the second issue that I had. And the last one, I was starting to develop rheumatoid arthritis. And RA is 1 million percent caused by wheat. Uh-huh. So whether you agree about anything else about the grains, if you have arthritis, the only way for you not to have arthritis is to stop eating wheat. So you can just decide when you've had enough pain. Because uh-huh. in my experience, you know, changing the way that we eat has to generally come from the depths of an enormous amount of pain. And so, A, after my experience with my daughter, I didn't want to sacrifice two more children when I had already seen the the truth. So Uh there was that. There was no amount of poison that was ever going to be good enough for us. And... I've been adamant, vehemently adamant about that. And only when my book came out and we started traveling have we compromised what we ate. And by that time, uh, my son was an adult. My daughter is 15. And they will tell you that we will eat steaks from Longhorn if we're on the road. Just not to starve. But but I also have a hot plate in my car. And I can't do that more than once. Like, you know, I can't do it all the time. I can't, like, do it every day. Or I can't do it, like, once a week. Okay? Uh-huh. And so it's not something that's a normal thing for us. But, you know, if we're making a drive out to Tennessee and we bring food on the road and we can get through and it's all fine, it's fine. Also, sometimes we just need to have a break and get out. We need a break. So while we're having a break, we might do that at a Longhorn. And we only started doing that way later. But if we do go there, then we're only going to eat the steak. And we're not going to eat anything else. But that's it. Okay. Yeah, it's just going to be the steak. And we're going to tell them they can keep their sides and whatever, you know. Uh Uh-huh. But at home, so when you said how damaged is her gut, did you start with like a gaps before? I remember talking to you. You're like, yeah. you may need to heal your gut we, before even raw milk. Yeah, I mean, that's yes, a yeah. That's we something I think people should know. Like, you may not even need raw milk yet right. if your gut's not filled enough. So gaps, the gaps protocol came out after, 
anything okay. that we were doing. There was no GAPS protocol at that time. There was no just, there was no paleo at that time. There was okay. no whole thirty. You know, um, when uh-huh. we were going through what we were going through, then Dallas Austin and Melissa Hartwig were still writing whole thirty. Whole thirty didn't come out until after two thousand nine. Uh-huh. And Jeffrey Smith's book about GMOs was also just published after 2009. And, Uh I mean, 2009 was when my daughter died. 2009 was when a whole lot of things happened. And all of these people were coming up with their research at the same time as we were going through it at the hospital. I mean, just that's how powerfully God was lining everybody up to come out and start revealing the truth at the same time. Isn't that crazy? I think it's awesome that they, that timing, I obviously don't think anything you walked through was awesome, but I do know and a hundred percent believe it from my own journey. Like he's a redeemer. He makes beauty from ashes yeah. and 20 year, you know, well, it's not been 20, but 14 years later, it's beautiful what you're you've done for other families what you've done for your children um that are still earthside and not in heaven you know and mm-hmm. and mina's legacy is beautiful and all the people you've woven together through this is beautiful so um yeah it's the time when you said earlier god is always on time 100 mm-hmm. percent agree yeah god is on time every time and so um you know we at home our home is sacred and one of the things that we had to cho- to figure out, you were talking about the problems of having a 7 a.m. and a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift. Like, my husband and I never saw each other for almost a year. Because when I say almost didn't see each other, he would be coming into the hospital while I was leaving the hospital while we were at Duke Children's Hospital for a solid six months. And it was insanity. I don't think people realize that when children are diagnosed with cancer, they're not outpatient. Uh-huh. They're inpatient because those people are using our children as guinea pigs. They get, from a child that's two years old, they get 10 years worth of research from a two-year-old, you know, every month. They, it's, it's, it's crazy. And so they're, uh-huh. they're testing them with these chemotherapies. uh uh-huh. That, that means that my daughter became a pincushion, right? That's what I told them. I said, mm-hmm. she, she's not going to be your pincushion anymore. We're leaving. And to which they came after us for our kids. That's a different story, too. You were asking me. No, I, I do. I think that's interesting that you brought that up because I think, you know, we talk about, you know, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture coming to your home. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then I've heard Joel say that, you know, they confiscated his beef. And my other friend, Maureen Diaz, has been to FDA sit-ins and raids and, like, Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania raw milk farmers. And and the bravery it takes to keep operating a milk farm is zero, zero compared to a mom saying, you're not taking my children. Like, that is every mom's worst fear, and you face that down. Mm-hmm. to do what was best for your daughter. That's huge. And and just standing up to all of these institutions takes every ounce of energy and bravery you can muster, but you faced it. And that's, that's I don't know, that's honorable. And, and what you did for her to bring her home and risk that is honorable. Yeah, I have to say, I don't know if I've ever said this to you, but when your mom said to you, you did the right thing, when you went back and her scans were clear for your mom to verbalize that over you was huge because in my own journey, I've had my mom question me and I love my mom dearly. I do. But to be questioned by your mom is hard Mm -hmm. to be questioned by your mom while your daughter is dying and you're going against mainstream Mm -hmm. institutions who everybody thinks is the end all be all, Mm -hmm. but you know best and your mom to be on your side was like, I cried when I read that. I was like, thank God for her mom. Mm -hmm. I mean, and she did that when it mattered. Yeah. Because there was plenty of times that she doubted me, and she still doesn't really, They, our family doesn't really do what we think should be done. I mean, when Mina died, they were just like, well, now we can get back to normal. I was like, oh, my gosh. No, we can't. We'll never. I've, I've learned to read now, so no. Now I can't pretend like I don't know how to read. Right. 
So yeah, this is no, new. This is no back to normal. This is your eyes are wide open and mm-hmm. it's keep trying to peel off the layers of brainwashing. Yeah. Yes. I think that, you know, I know we've gotten way far away from what your question was, which I honestly can't even remember right now, but <laughs> what you're uh, eating in your house. Oh, in the house. Yeah. Your okay. So here's hardcore. what we do. Let me, let me, let me definitely answer this question. I thought it was important to answer. So for 14 years, well, I don't know. Wait, how many years is that? From 2009 until 2020 or 2020. That's 10 years, right? 11, yeah. 11 years. Okay. So, yeah. For that many years, we didn't eat at restaurants. Like, full stop. We didn't eat at a restaurant. Wow. So, now what was funny was at the very beginning of all of that, you know, my husband's family's in New Jersey, so we would drive up to Jersey and we'd drive back, right? And on the way there, I mean, I used to have to, Tara, if you know you got to put all the food away for three children under five in a car for all the way from North Carolina to New Jersey, this is a 10, 12 hour ride, right? And then you got to take all the food there that you want to eat because you're only going to eat from not the grocery store. So, you know, I got one of those big white uh, seven day coolers, you know, that, <laughs> that's what was in my van. So, any, yeah, normally the only people who know about these seven-day coolers either work a farmer's market or they know that they've been on a, a boat where they keep ice for the fish on a seven-day cooler on the boat, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, not very many people know about the cool, the seven-day coolers. <laughs> but, any, anyway, we had a seven-day cooler that we would fill with, with it can, you can only fit two milk crates in, in a seven-day cooler. And then in the middle, we'd have a, a, a bunch of meat, which was our ice for the trip, basically. And then in, in, the, in the coolers, uh, I mean, in the crates, on one side, we'd have all the raw dairy. And on the other side, we'd have eggs and things like that. And so, we literally took every single thing that we were going to eat. And at that time, we were just not eating wheat. So, we would carry, like, we had a gluten-free baker here local. And so, we had, you know, different breads and things that she made and we were actually at that time we were using um what is that grain we did eat we did eat bread made out of um oh my goodness i forget i'll have to think about it and it'll come it'll come back to me it's an ancient grain it's that african ancient grain um like amber say it again I don't know. No. Um, oh, my goodness. It'll come to me. Oh, teff. Okay. It's teff. Okay. We were eating teff bread. We ate that for... A, for a, a, I, My gluten-free baker worked with us for 10 years, and so we did eat teff bread. Okay. For those years, okay? And, um, and I will say that that must have helped us because we did get better. You know what I mean? It it uh-huh. it it remo- it got rid of all the eczema. It got rid of all the acne's and all the different things. And for the longest time at the beginning, I was trying to do sourdough just for the record. And we had an organic sourdough bread company here. Uh huh. And um, that only lasted for like a year. Uh huh. Before I was just still not getting better, and I was the canary in the coal mine, and it was mostly my health. You know, but the kids still had eczema with the sourdough. Mm. But as okay. soon as we put them on teff and we got rid of all the other stuff, then, you know, and the thing about working with a gluten-free baker is I was able to set our sugar levels, which we reduced our sugar level dramatically so much to the point that when we had cupcakes or cakes or anything, you know, for the children's birthday parties, my mom would always say, I don't like y'all's cakes and cookies. And I think your baker just always doesn't put sugar in them. She thought we were baking things without sugar. (laughs) And that's how low our sugar level was. Because we did, it was funny, I know how low the sugar level has to be to make a cookie still stick together like a cookie. Because you need sugar to hold the cookie together. Uh-huh. And so we know the minimum amount of sugar that's required with the butter to make the sh- cookie 
work. Isn't that funny? I think that's awesome that you went through all that experiment. That's what I was getting at. Like, how did you find out the diet? And it seems like you went through a lot of trial and error. Wow. And you worked with other people in your community to keep going on your food journey, to keep making it cleaner, keep making it cleaner, keep yes. making it cleaner. And yeah. I feel like as moms, we're all on that journey. Yes. And sometimes we think, oh, someone just jumped there overnight. Like somehow you magically have the, Mm-mm. you know, but I want to take a minute to, to say, can you tell me about your coaching program? Because I know a lot of people that I know, I mean, like we lived in Franklin. So in my group, there's a lot of people from Franklin. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of people from Fayetteville, Huntsville, and then just, I just would say Middle Tennessee in general because of, um, in Nashville, because Jay works in Nashville, but all kind of in this Middle Tennessee area, and then Huntsville's found us. And so there are moms, I can't tell you how many moms come and say, oh, my kid vomits all mm-hmm. the time. Like they have eosinophil esophagitis, or yes. they definitely have what they, what they think is lactose intolerance. They just don't know it's dead milk intolerance, you know, or um, mm-hmm. eczema, different issues with their kids. They find us. Mm-hmm. And so I would like to know, I w- how do they, how do you reach you for coaching? So I, I coach, if they want, if they want to coach with me, then I have a link and I'll share it, um, in the, in the notes for this podcast. Um, okay. and I can also, uh, if they go to my Instagram or, uh, YouTube channels, then it's on my link tree. Okay. Um, if they are interested in coaching, uh, okay. most of the coaching that I do, the majority of what I do is within my CSA because then I can control the food that they have access to. But if okay. they're outside of my CSA, like let's say they're getting milk from you, then, you know, I coach people like that and because they have access to getting food from you. Uh-huh. I also have, um, you know, people who are in other areas of the country who I coach who don't have regenerative farmers around them. First thing I do is try to find a regenerative farm around them and try to connect them. And then if I can't do that, um, then Polyface ships. So awesome. they can order from Polyface. Yes, they, they can order from mm-hmm. Polyface Yum. And even if they're getting their beef and their milk from you, but they don't have the option for other things, then they can get that those items from Polyface. But you know, I try to help them find everything that they can local first. Mm-hmm. Because it's, first of all, it's just important to main, maintain your circadian rhythm. But secondly, obviously, you want to support people who are around you. And finally, it's too expensive to ship meat. So that's your last resort, always. You know, it's always better to get something local. And I and, agree, but some of the things like I just made a pate from their hearts and livers. We had a lot of our own. Yes. But I wanted to make some extra and I was up there. I think you were there the last time I was there. And I'm it's it's winter and I'm cleaning out our freezers, turning things over. And I was so glad to have extra. And so I could put extra pate back in the freezer. I mm-hmm. I I told my husband I get his sick addiction to potted meat. He doesn't do that anymore, thank goodness. <laughs> 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 we've come a long way baby yeah, um yeah yeah uh that's what I was gonna say it's like okay you know I'm not I'm not equipped or set up nor do I have the talent to do that but I know that you do and then your book mm-hmm. um they can order like I'm gonna carry it in the store but they can also I'm sure it's available on the Amazon um actually not listen. anymore so, oh, okay, so how do they order it? Yeah, if they order the book, it'll be from um, from my website. Um, okay. So my book came out in 2020. Okay. Which was not a good time for anything to happen. <laughs> you know, like so many things collapsed. And I never actually got to give it a really big promotion. And then I've been censored like crazy since then. And I so, would assume, I mean, just the title is going to get you censored. Yeah, you know, I mean, meat riot. But. Yeah, I'm super censored. And yeah, I, I'm mostly blocked because I was teaching mothers how to cook meat. Like uh-huh. if I post videos of how to cook meat, then I'm totally censored. Every time uh-huh. I do a meat video, it, it like gets flagged or whatever. It's, uh-huh. it's, it's crazy. I mean, 
and, 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 and people don't know how to cook meat. Everybody's been trained by the orthodoxy to overcook meat and literally turn it into something that's very difficult to digest when meat is the easiest food to digest. It's the only thing that can cure the cancer. It's the only thing that can cure the, uh, you know, multiple sclerosis. It's the only thing that can cure all of the autoimmunities. And do you know it's the only thing that will chelate heavy metals and toxins and everything out of your body? Did not know that. I mean, there's plants that supposedly will do it, but I don't know anybody who does these plant protocols and actually lives a long life post all of that you know, with a cancer diagnosis. I don't know too many people that are able to do it without the meat. Okay, so now i got a question for you. How do you get your kids on board? Because if I feed my kids meat every meal, they're going to be like, Mom, you know, were your kids little and they just went along with it? Or did you have to, like, coach them that, like, nope? I mean, because I do think it were, I remember this vague conversation you and I had a couple of years ago where you were like, yeah, we brought our own food to birthday parties. Like, mm -hmm. we did. You have to be the weirdo. Yeah. Like, you well, have to say, and which is, okay, I, I don't mind being the weirdo. Like I, I used to I bring it, have... I would bring a dish for them to share. So it wasn't like, oh, that's you know, nice. so like I would just tell the children, okay, I'm bringing this dish. To sh now here was what my problem was when I would bring a dish to share and it was the only item that my kids could eat and uh -huh. then everybody else would eat it and they wouldn't eat all the other garbage that was there. That was what was a bigger, that was, you know what? That was two things. That was first of all, a test that I wasn't trying to, to have. I wasn't trying to do this test. But interestingly, if I bring a, a meal to a party that nobody knows me, nobody knows why I'm bringing that dish, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, we're just the, a guest at somebody's party, and we bring a dish to pass. Everybody will finish our dish, and they won't eat any of the other garbage there. Mm. What are, What's going on? Or... Even if they're eating all that other stuff, they finish ours first. So I would have to put some, put our stuff on the side or bring two, like one to share and one for nobody to touch. So your kids would always have it. So did they ever give you any pushback? Like, mom, I want a cupcake. Mom, can I have a sucker? I mean, all these other kids have a sucker. I mean, I kind of feel like my kids are assaulted everywhere we go. Like mm -hmm. church. My kids have been I mean, told, I have told them the truth forever. And we never, and so, just and, and so we've, well, originally in the very beginning, I used to, so this is how it started. The way that it started was our kids were not in school. I was homeschooling them. And then one of the moms that tried to join the CSA ran a school, a micro school. And she said, how do I get your food? And I had heard about her school and I was wanting to talk to her, but she reached out to me before I reached out to her. And I said, well, I won't let you get any food until you help me figure out their schooling. <laughs> and she was like, what? I said, well, I heard you have a sugar-free school. Tell me what that's all about. That's and awesome. So then she started explaining that to me. And that was, again, just, you know, God's timing. And so I had a, a sugar-free school now for my children to go to. And the, okay. ru the rule at their school was you can't share food, period. So okay. none of the kids, awesome. every child had to bring their own food and every child was not allowed to share their food. And then whenever they had a party or something, it had to be a sugar-free event. And we just took things that didn't involve wheat or sugar. And so um, I, 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 at that time, we had our gluten-free baker. So... It wasn't really a big deal for me not to have a thing of cupcakes made up for if they were going to a birthday. If they were invited to a birthday, then we had some cupcakes for them. Oh, we, ha awesome. we had some things for them that we would take. And so the kids were able to have, you know, something. Now, if something happened at school and they had to say no because they couldn't eat it and they came home and they felt like they weren't able to participate, I told them to tell me if they ever had to miss something at a birthday and that I would make it right for them. And so if they ever told me that, I would say, okay, do you want to go to Toys R Us and get a new toy? Or do you want to go to Whole Foods and find some clean candy? That's awesome. Because they do have it, like Zolly. 
you know, yes. like the, I don't know what you think about Zolly. That like must be something, something about, new. I haven't heard of that, but yeah. it's a xylitol. Candy no, zone. xylitol is not good. Zero. Tara. Okay. Dang. Man, I have so much to learn. Okay. So what candy, cause let's talk about this. What candy yeah. is good? So it should have real, hopefully if you can find something with either animal fat or no, fa no plant fat. Okay. I mean, I'll tell you that I think that regular sugar is better than any of the chemical sugars and okay. anything that doesn't have petrochemical food coloring. Kind of feel like I'm going to have to make it. And then my next question is, can you make a cookbook? Like, can't you just jump on that for us? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'm, everybody keeps saying this to me. And the funniest thing about it is that Joel Solitin's like, there's 10 million cookbooks out there. We don't need one more. And <laughs> no, for sure we do. And, and, and proof, proof, proof being is, you know, Sophia Ng, you know, uh, I mean, yeah. that, that book, you know, was needed. There wasn't a twist on that. And I feel like, you know, for moms who really want to go carnivore and I'll be transparent with you. I've, I've known a lot of people that have gone carnivore and they expect to do it just for a little while and then they extend it because they feel so good. Yes. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so I'm, I'm thinking, oh, what if we just did it for a little bit? But in the back of my mind, I know it's going to be healing. And so I'm like, I got to know how to commit to this for the long term. So and, um, let me speak to that. Resource. So you asked me about that. I want to speak on that before I forget it again, because we okay. start getting down these other little rabbit holes. But um, so for the record, my children and my husband are not carnivore. Um, they don't want to be carnivore. But they are mostly carnivore, and they don't really know how carnivore they are, because <laughs> because I just, and and but I don't make a whole bunch of other stuff. So for the, the way that we did it was a cowboy diet, and that's what my encouragement is for everybody, is that really at the end of the day, what I find that most children and most parents really only really want is meat and potatoes or meat and pasta or rice. Or some kind of grain, bread. Uh -huh. At the end of the day, you're putting meat and bread together. You're using bread for a vehicle for fat, or you're using rice, or you're using pasta. And so, why don't you replace everything with potatoes? I have heard you say that before, and I literally have potatoes sitting by my, I like cooked bacon mm -hmm. and sausage, yes. and I have these potatoes sitting there, and I'm like, next meal, we're adding potatoes, and when you're getting off wheat, I've heard you say that, lean heavy on potatoes. Yes. Well, Jay's, you know, Irish descent, so that works well for us. We all <laughs> love potatoes. Yeah. My favorite yeah. food group in college was french fries. I know they're not, but I have beef tallow now, so maybe yeah. I could fry, can I fry them yes. beef tallow? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So, okay, I, make, I make french fries. Listen to what I do, Tara. That's easy. Because frying is kind of messy and a pain in the butt and uses a whole lot of that fat, right? Hello. Yeah. So let me just tell you what the easy way is. This is the easy mama way. You preheat your oven to 450 degrees. You cut yeah. your potatoes in cubes. Eat, you know, consistent cut is consistent cook. Okay? Uh -huh. So you peel them definitely and you cube them into whatever size consistent cut is consistent cook, okay? Okay. Now, you take them, you slather, you you uh, put them in a mixing bowl or in the cast iron pan. It's a, I use the cast iron pan. Just use the pan as your mixing bowl, okay? And uh -huh. pour your lard in over it and work it into, with your hands, work it into all the potatoes in the pan. Okay. So, so now you've greased the pan and you've, you've greased the potatoes, but you don't necessarily have a pool of lard in there, right? Right. Okay, now put the pan in the oven for like 15, 20 minutes, pull it uh -huh. out, take a, a big spatula, and then just get it from, like unstick the potatoes, because you know the starch is going to kind of make it stick to the pan. So you unstick them all around and try to flip them around, kind of stir it up a little bit. And now put them back in for another 15 minutes or so. Then unstick them again. And maybe you do it for another 5 or 10 minutes. So okay. that's about maybe 30 minutes in the oven. But you're doing other things and you're not worrying about anything. But yeah. you will get crispy potatoes out of there that are just roasted. But they taste like fried. And they have lard all over them and salt. You larded and salted them. 
okay, I'm, I'm down with this. I'm down with trying it. You know, I don't like the new year, new diet stuff because I feel like winter's for rest, but I do have, I've had time this month to think about, okay, what do I want to do different this year? Yeah. Just kind of pray through that. And I told you we were like focused on the soil. Yes. There's a couple of conferences. Like I really want to attend eco ag at the end of this year. Cause now we're farmers. We're not, you know, we're not homesteaders. We do homestead some for us, but we're really producers. And we mm-hmm. need a little more support in that area. Yeah. And so, but for us, like, walking what you talk is important yes and healing yes and so I can't I can't really be authentic if I'm you know selling raw milk but then you know I'm I'm eating Papa John's that's not gonna work you know well so it's my encouragement for you to just focus on giving up wheat you don't have to go carnivore why don't you just give up wheat because what you're gonna end up doing is you'll if you're if you're really being true to what I'm saying then you're just going to eat meat and potatoes. So here's the other thing. When you're on the road and you do need to stop somewhere, that's fine. Make yourself stop at Longhorn. That's either going to be too expensive or you're going to eat, you're going to cook. Like that's what we had to do. It's a, it's an expensive meal. It's expensive yeah. and it's not as good as what we have at home. So do we just want to do it all the time? No, it's stupid. Like we're not wanting to do that. So, Mm -hmm. but if we're going to need to stop, if we're just exhausted, if we're just fried because we did a conference and we did this and we did that and you want, you know, it's a lot of work. So by the time that's all over with, you know, sometimes it's fine to go into the hotel with your hot plate and flip your burgers or you're just like, good grief. Can I just get a break for a minute? Cause I'm tired. (laughs) You know, I just need to sit down, eat, feed everybody and just stop it. Right. So if that has to happen, especially cause you got little babies. You know, yeah. I mean, I know they're not teeny tiny babies, but whatever, they're still young and they still, yeah. they still need help. So, and also I don't care. Like I have teenagers, they can cook here now, but they're not going to do a good job in a hotel room on a hot plate like me. No, that's what I was just thinking. Yeah. I would have to probably take potatoes too. Cause my kids love burgers. They love them. But they would feel like like that, like they missed out on something if I just served them burgers. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to imagine. They will. What they will not. Like. You're you're going to miss out. They're not. If they don't have it available because you don't have it available, they're not going to care. They're going to want more burgers. You just need to make sure you give them three patties and not one. Yeah. So okay. all of these things that you're telling me are you arguing for yourself, not them. <laughs> oh my gosh! There's that spanking again. <laughs> Well, well, you know, you know, I love you, but like, I mean, yeah. first of all, when you're on the road and you're just trying to make a bunch of burger patties for the kids and yourself, it's easier. It's faster. You don't need two pans. You don't have time to do potatoes. No, that's true. And you know, what's so funny is I'm sitting here thinking that I'm like, my kids don't care. They'd be so enamored by just being in a hotel room. Yeah. They don't care if they're eating burgers or strawberries. No. Like just. I'm they, in a hotel room. Woo! They might not even sit down to eat because they're so jazzed from being on the road. And exactly. That's fun, you know? Exactly. They're gonna be. They're gonna be. You're gonna be like, oh my god! I have to give them like five things, and they're gonna be like, no. If you told them, okay, all we have to eat is burger patties, so we're gonna do that, guys. And here's some cheese on the side. If you want them to do the cheese or put a slice of cheese on it, I mean, I don't understand how. I mean, they're gonna be just really suffering with this horrible meal that you're giving them (laughs) i mean you're feeding them your beef fried in lard in a cast iron pan on a hot plate in a hotel and you're telling me that they're being deprived of something and if you carry you carry your raw milk for them to drink you think they the milk is the carbs so they're the milk dairy is our carbs so we have raw milk in my family, we have raw yogurt in the house. We have raw sour cream. We have raw cheese. We have eggs. We have potatoes in here. And I keep some onions and garlic for seasoning their stuff. I don't personally eat it because it, I, it just doesn't make me feel very good, okay? And uh-huh. for them, I will also make like an Indian rice meal once a week. Or they'll have sushi, because they're not 100% carnivore. And right. if you pay attention to even like Dr. Kim Berry and Nisha, then, uh-huh. you know, there's a spectrum on which people can tolerate things. And 
Am I advocating for them to be able to have all that stuff? No. My son, I will tell you that if he has a choice, he will mostly just be carnivore. If you put a bunch of stuff in front of him and there's enough meat that will satisfy him, he will eat all the meat. The only reason he's going to eat any of the potatoes or something else is because he doesn't feel like there's enough meat and or he feels like he is not going to leave enough food for other people to eat. Right. And he's just trying to be not gluttonous and he's trying to be gracious and conscious of the fact that other people need to eat also. Uh -huh. But if you wait until the end, he will clear the rest of the meat. And my daughter, if she has enough variety of meat too, like we have a lot of day trip seafood. You asked me some time ago about us living in Tennessee or somewhere. And I said to you that we are like really wanting to stay close to the ocean because we're tied to the water. Well, over here right now, we have a relationship where for the past uh, 15 years, we've had incredible day boat seafood every single week. That's awesome. So I have people, we have anglers that are fishing for us all year, all the time, every, every week. And we're ruined because we have day boat seafood, a variety of it seasonally every single week. So... Our kids get the highest quality fish and shrimp and scallops and and our guys that are that are shrimping on the coast of North Carolina that are doing it the old school way um you know these are marine biologists just like farmers have to be you know vets if they're doing a good job these guys are marine biologists they're not going to over shrimp because that means they're not going to have any babies and they're not going to have shrimp next year that's dumb uh -huh. So they have to be really careful. And so there's a season for shrimp because you have to leave them alone so that they can actually reproduce, right? So when you leave them... I did not know that. Yeah, just like all the seafood, there is spawning season for every uh -huh. creature, you know? Just like there's a uh -huh. molting season for the chickens and so there's no eggs or whatever. There's a season for everything. So, in the same way, there's an abundance of shrimp and then there's no shrimp, okay? So, what they started doing is they have an arrangement now with this local packer that is peeling, devaining, and uh, instant, quick freezing the shrimp. So, we have local peeled and deveined IQF shrimp in one-pound packs in the freezer that we support that 100% year round with my CSA with the food church, you know? And uh -huh. so that is supporting these shrimpers. Otherwise they don't have a solid income all year. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And so there's a lot of people investing in this, just like you need people. If they're going to come pick milk up from you, you need a standing order. You don't need them to be thinking about, I'm going to get it every other week. I'm going to get it once a month. I want a whole bunch of milk now. Yeah, if they're not getting it every single week, you just can't care about them. And it's not because you don't want them to have what they need. It's just that the milk comes every day. Yep, it's a commitment, just like you said, at CSA. So always tell people, I won't make you sign a contract to get the milk, but you have to commit weekly like a CSA, and they pay monthly. Mm -hmm. So we count on our customers monthly. You can pop in and get it because it's technically pet milk, um, you know, and I think I always say, you know, you don't have to drive, you don't have to sign a contract to get pink slime. I really just, there's something in my spirit that just doesn't like signing a contract to get a God given food. Well, but Tara, we let me give just preference to people who are committed me, on, hands down every time. How about this? How about, um, under God's law, and on the land and soil, we don't do contracts. That is a dead, dead, that's something people do on the water. Merit that's a maritime law thing. So only living, living men and women operate in honor. We are, operate with agreement and we operate with, with uh, radical self-reliance and self-responsibility. So either they're going to raise their own cows and milk their own cows or they're going to make a commitment to get the best milk that they can get, or they just don't need milk. Uh -huh. That's really all. And that's not, that's not me spanking somebody or being ugly. This is the truth. Remember the truth that we're all walking on or looking yeah. for? So truth aligns with morality, 
And lies are aligned with immorality. And anybody who's walking the line is immoral. You have to pick a side of truth or lies. Otherwise, you're choosing lies. Because there's no line. There's only the truth and there's only the lie. So either be honest and honorable or don't. We don't care. That's why my shirt said, I don't care. And on the back of the shirt, it says, there is great love here for you. Because I can't support your immorality. My morality will not allow me to support your immorality. And that's really all. You have a world right now of immorality that is being entertained and supported as something good and acceptable. And that is because of the corporatocracy, which is dead. Corporate entities are dead. So, okay, go back to that because I bet you anything. So I Googled that just to make sure I was understanding what you were saying by that. Okay. Um, and so here's the definition. Uh, corporatocracy is an economic, political, and judicial system controlled by business, corporation, or corporate interest. Is that how you see it? Or what do you mean when you say corporatocracy? That's exactly what I mean. Our yeah. current, our current, what everybody thinks is our government is not our government. It is the corporatocracy. It is the United States of America Incorporated. It is the U.S. Corporation. We are the government. We the people. The ones that haven't been at work for so long. Our government has been dormant for 150 years. That's a different problem. So what everybody is saying when they say, I have never said... I used to say, but I stopped saying, I used to say that I was upset with the government, but I'm not upset with the government. And for the last 15 years, I've known it's not the government, it's the corporatocracy, and that's what I wrote about in my book. I don't think uh -huh. that you ever heard me say that I was mad at the government. I said, I don't support the corporatocracy. So, the corporatocracy, now this is a whole other interview we could do. The corporatocracy is owned and run and managed by the Vatican and the Pope. And then they use the crown, the fraudulent British crown. That crown is operating on water jurisdiction, and they are the territorial um, corporations that we subcontracted with our constitution our original actually there's three american constitutions and our original constitution was for the our partnership when we hired the british municipal uh sorry the british territorial um corporation to support us with their navy because they had the largest navy and they also were given some other you know um work to do here within our colonies but the original con the other original constitution was that they were to be um they they were to have access to all of our inner waterways and our coast and they were protecting us on the high seas so that we could do business with europe and that was what the first constitution was written for. A constitution is a contract a nation makes with, you know, another nation. And in our case, it was our foreign subcontractors, which were the Brits. And then we had a second con uh, constitution with the Vatican because the Pope owns the postal service. And the Pony Express wasn't really working for us very well. And we needed a better way to manage postal service. And also we weren't able, you know, we otherwise didn't have any way to write back to Europe. You know, there were people, everybody who had come here wanted to be able to, you know, send mail back and forth. Or, you know, po post to post some mail back and forth, right? And so we needed a postal service. And so the second constitution was with the Pope and the Vatican for... Um, the postal services. What people don't uh, also know is that the post office is not just a service that is, you know, delivering what we call mail, um, which is actually supposed to be called post. 
So there's a difference between mail and post, and we can get into that too later. But right now, what I, my bigger point is that the post office is a court and it is a bank. And in fact, when you buy postal money orders, those are the only gold back currency that, I mean, because our fiat currency is not gold back. But if you go and you buy a money order, that money order is gold backed. By the Vatican. Yeah, that's gold backed by the Vatican. But mm -hmm. you can literally um, dispute claims and you can uh, dispute uh, and, and actually manage um, any dispute that you have in writing through postal court. Just the same way that you record your trademarks or your copyrights. Um, and when you incorporate, then you do all these things through postal court. And that is the reason why the Vatican and the Pope own all the corporations and the patents and the copyrights, including all of these sickening ones, like where they copyright and they have all of these uh, medications that are uh, trademarked. And patents, the patents, sorry, the patents, not the trademarks. Well, I guess they do have trademarks also. But the patent that they have for all the medications that we don't want, whether we take them orally or whether they are, you know, subcutaneous. So. That's super interesting. And that is, I mean, that is definitely... I think a whole conversation that could be a whole nother hour mm -hmm. interview because I have like a million questions going down that. Yeah. That I path. Just, let's and just I'm so to, not educated in that path. To wrap that up, I just want to make a point that all the subcutaneous medications are all patented. And uh, why would you allow your sacred bloodstream to be violated with a patent? Why don't we just leave everybody with that? We've been talking for an hour and a half. I think yeah. I think that this this casual conversation has been full of truth bombs. A lot and a lot to think on. I have a lot to think of myself, and I I mean I definitely am into breaking down walls and breaking breaking off layers, peeling off layers of things that are lies. You know, and you said you know truth aligns with morality. Well, I'm after the truth. I'm after the truth for me. I'm after the truth for my kids. We want health, we want long life, and we want to operate under, you know, God's law and natural law. And if you don't know what that is, and you, you're, you're still operating under assumptions that, oh, that's fine, or that's fine, or you don't even know what that is. You're not even aware. You have to keep pressing. And I will say, I don't know if you're like this, but the first couple of times I hear something, I'm like, is there something to that? Wow, that's interesting. That sounds crazy. What? And then it's just like everything else. Like the more you think about it, you're like, wait, I've known, I think I've known since my mom was vaccine injured. That was my first wake up call that, you know, uh, medicine isn't always good for people. And we, we had that conversation about allopathic medicine is good. Like I say the ER is good. You know, when you, when you have an emergency, go to the ER, but if you're not after health and actually true life, then you're not really there's no business you have to do there um, other than the emergency room. But, um, but anyway, so for this, like, even though my mind is saying, Oh, the Pope owns all that. What? Why? Right. I know. Why? There. <laughs> like, why? That's why? a good question. Why? why? How? How about how? I, my question yeah. was how, like how, who decided that the Pope was over the air jurisdiction, the crown was over the water jurisdiction, and that living men and women are over the land jurisdiction. But if you don't know that you are over the land jurisdiction, I, honestly, living men and women have general jurisdiction. But jurisdiction is a whole nother conversation that we could have. But, you know, and that that's way a big, that's a very big conversation. I think what people need to right now just be thinking is, you know something is wrong. You know something is wrong. You might not know what it is, but why, you know, when you really think about it, 
everything goes back to the corporatocracy. All roads lead to Rome. All roads lead to Rome. And, you know, if you feel that we've assaulted your belief system, I think that we did, Tara. I think we kind of, yeah, we kind of did. Why? Because you, you know, all beliefs are our thoughts you keep thinking. And you could just change your mind anytime and start thinking new thoughts. And then, like, I don't know, Tara, have your beliefs changed? Uh, for sure, over time. Yes, a lot. Yeah. I mean, I used to be that girl that would enjoy having all the foodie food and go through New York and all the different restaurants and get dressed up and just try something new all the time. Like, what's not fun about that? Right. You know, until I got so sick that I couldn't do that anymore. You know, I have to yeah, just... Yeah, and then I think about seed oils. Like, ooh, I really want to try that new restaurant. I'm like, yeah, no, seed oils. <laughs> That's the problem. I mean, like, I really want to go and be social, and, and yeah. I can't. I mean, I'm like, dude, can't you guys just all cook in butter? Like, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, if you don't believe in, you know, ghee, and you don't want to make ghee, and you don't want to use lard or tallow, which, by the way, is way cheaper. I mean, right now, Shan <laughs> Terry, you... <laughs> can make butter all day long. You can right. render you can render that into your own ghee. And what's easier between that or making lard? Definitely ghee. And um you know, I don't know. I'm just saying I'm like looking back through my notes. I was just writing and writing and writing. I have so much just to kind of ruminate over. <laughs> um but really mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for you. I wanna say that. I am very thankful for you. I don't think it's you know, coincidence that we stayed home from our homestead church today. Jay, Jay uh, had a scheduled work today, which is really odd. Um, but he had to go for that. And I was like, I'm going to be running this pirate ship alone. And <laughs> um, wondering, you know, kind of wondering what I'm going to do. I have some bone broth going and just some, you know, food projects. And that we connected today. I'm just so thankful because mm -hmm. it's so much inspiration to keep on on the same path, but dig deeper. And, and keep pressing in because it takes a lot of energy to undo these things and to look and to, and to change your thoughts. Yeah. It takes a lot of dedication to do that. And I appreciate you taking so much time out today to help, help answer questions and just help encourage me along that path. Well, I appreciate it. You sent me some message and whatever it was, it was just a God thing. And the timing just works out because God's always on time. He is always on time. Okay. Well, I can't wait to talk again. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much.